Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Makeshift Stories presents a monthly journey into the improbable. Today's story, 194, An Unintentional Extraordinary Life 4, Birthday Biohack. Read by Mitchell 2. Audio post-production by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, no good deed goes unpunished. I generally hate family gatherings. They make me feel... Well, they make me feel inadequate. Cousin Vortex will boast about his latest mega adventure and how much money he's made on product endorsements and merchandise. Granddad will reminisce about the good old days when superheroes didn't need collateral damage insurance and people overlooked the property destruction caused in a battle with an evil villain. They even used to thank you for saving their city or country, he'll claim. Grandma will wax elegantly away on the dangers of rogue evil geniuses and complain about having to come out of retirement to keep one or two at bay until her great-granddaughter is old enough to take over the family biz. Then, finally, the conversation will get around to what I've been doing, and that's when I feel like crawling under a rock. What can I say? I bid on two jobs last month, and the one I got turned into a disaster when three other superheroes from Hero on the Way showed up. And, as a result of the ensuing lawsuit, I was forced to attend a team-building workshop. That kind of stuff just doesn't play well around the dinner table. But last week was my niece's sixth birthday, so I had to go. I just love my little niece, Isabel. She is so cute, and man, is she sharp. She inherited her great-grandma's mountain-sized brain and has already started to manifest her superpower. But what do you get a hyper-intelligent six-year-old? Last year, I bought her a big, fluffy teddy bear. I can remember exactly how grandma reacted. Slow. She intentionally said Mo so faintly no one could hear it. You've got a little girl with a brain the size of a mountain. A stuffy? She complained, giving me the how dare you underestimate your niece look. The slow nickname stuck, and everyone in the family uses it now, including little Izzy. Thank you for the very nice bear, Uncle Slow. My niece if nothing else, is hyper-polite. She gets that from my mom, who always started her epic battles with an evil villain by saying, I'm very sorry. Insert evil villain's name. I really am, but I must now destroy you. I hope you won't mind too much. I could see Isabel's frighteningly intelligent eyes and massive intellect working on the teddy bear problem Uncle Slow had inadvertently created. Bless her little heart and massive brain, she was not going to let the family matriarch totally humiliate me again. This is why I like the kid so much. Her great-grandma had given her a Cosmo Smart Robotics kit. Isabel looked at the kit, then considered the fuzzy pink bear for a moment, before she proceeded to tear the stuffy apart and reassemble it using bits from the robotics kit creating a mechanical polyester pink and metal Frankenbear. See, great-grandma? She had smiled sweetly. Uncle Slow knew exactly what I needed. Later, Izzy used the bear to terrorize the barky dog next door until the neighbor complained and Sis had to take Frankenbear away. So, I decided this year not to be embarrassed again and did my research before selecting my gift for little Izzy. Possibly, I should have spent more time considering all the potential outcomes. But I was driven by my desire not to be upstaged by great-grandma this year. 
I got to the party late, of course. The bus driver had decided to stop for a coffee break, and the line had been around the block. So, Great Grandma was glaring at me when I finally sat down at the table. You'll probably be late for your own funeral, Slow, she growled, but this time I was ready. I pulled a gift-wrapped box out of my pack and handed it to an excited Isabel, then smirked at the old woman with a see-if-you-can-top-this look. Isabel tore into the package with so much gusto, I thought she might have inherited my mother's super strength. Wow, two superpowers. For a brief instant, I was really jealous. Yes, I could slow time, but it was connected to a rather personal biological need. Isabel could manifest a power at will. Man, sometimes I hate the randomness of genetic inheritance. Little Izzy shredded the final piece of wrapping. It was biodegradable at my sister's insistence and had cost almost as much as the gift. Look, great grandma, Isabel gushed. Look what Uncle Slow gave me. She pushed the box toward the older woman, once professionally known as Cerebral. My, my, what do we have here, child? A DIY CRISPR gene editing starter kit. Cerebral gave me a cold smile, which said, game on, then turned back to her great granddaughter. I had spent days online looking for the perfect gift, at least one I could afford. Yes, there were intermediate and advanced kits, but the starter had colorful pictures of big-eyed fluffy jackalopes and cataroos. Learn the basics of nature biohacking, the ad had promised. The perfect educational gift for today's inquisitive young mind. Isabel was just turning six, and it almost fit my budget. I had to bid on a couple of cat rescues to cover the full cost. But I wanted the best for my niece, and I really wanted to outdo Great Grandma for once. Which, for a moment, I thought I had. Here's my gift, Isabel, Great Grandma crooned, flashing her intense green eyes my way. She slid an envelope to Isabel. I could see my niece's initial disappointment. Maybe Great Grandma had been bluffing. Yes, that had to be it. I did an imaginary fist pump. Open it, my love, the elderly woman encouraged. Isabel ripped the end off with the precision of a mail clerk, then shook the contents onto the table. A small card with a series of letters and numbers embossed onto it fell out. My niece looked puzzled. It's your very own password to the university's new supercomputer and neuronet. Isabel stared at the sequence like it was a magical incantation, then jumped up and gave Cerebral a big hug. Where was mine? I had been outdone once again, but neither of us considered how the two gifts might interact. Isabel looked wistfully at the cartoonish figure of the cute, furry, big-eyed Kataru on the side of the gene-editing starter kit and sighed. I really wanted a kitty. Great Grandma looked crestfallen, then recovered and shot an accusing, how can you let my great granddaughter who possesses a brain the size of a mountain, who will follow in my footsteps, get distracted by a furry pet, stare at my poor sis? Ephemera withered under the intensity of the unspoken accusation and was about to defend herself when Isabel interrupted. But mommy won't let me have one, cause litter boxes are too stinky and cat hair gets everywhere. Great Grandma immediately amped down her criticism and put on a self-satisfied grin. Your mother is right, dear. Cats are a problem, not a pet. Isabel looked from Great Grandma's password to the brightly colored imaginary animals on the DIY home Christmas starter kit, then smiled in a manner which should have warned us. Best birthday presents ever! She gushed, 
and clapped her little hands with glee. Let me tell you, I've learned the hard way. When a six-year-old with an expanding, ginormous brain does that, you need to pay attention. But at the time, we were all too distracted by family politics. I was in the middle of a gig, a good-paying one for once. It was a new category on Hero on the Way, and I was the main player in it. Actually, the only player, which allowed me to bid high. But maybe not high enough, considering what a gooey, stinky mess I found myself in. I will not go into details. It makes me shiver just thinking about it. Sis called me as I was wrapping up. It's Isabel's new pet cat. She spat out without even saying hello. Hello, Ephemera. It's good to hear from you, too. I'm okay, fine, thank you. You just called to find out what I'm up to. How nice. I'm just finishing the paperwork on a good-paying gig. It's become a problem. Sis ignored me and continued. I could tell she was piping mad. Pet cat? When did Isabel get a pet cat? You hate cats, Ephemera. Their litter trays stink, and all that fur and dandruff they drop everywhere, remember? She came up with a workaround, and you're responsible. Sis accused. Me? I didn't give her a cat. But you gave her that gene editing kit. Yes, an educational toy to show up grandma. So what's the harm? She can make a few genome hacks and a couple of mostly harmless bacteria. At least, that's what the ad claims. She's gone a bit beyond that. Isabel liked the pictures on the box. They inspired her. Slow, I need you over here to help clean up your mess. Sis hung up. Sheesh, she could have at least offered to teleport me over there. What's that saying? The road to... Uh is paved with good intentions. I was beginning to think I should have just gotten Isabel another pink stuffy and endured Grandma's dressing down. I really didn't want to go. What could I do that the rest of the family wouldn't be able to handle with one superpower tied behind their back? This time, the bus was early, for once. I noticed the passengers gave me a wide berth and the bus driver turned away and held his breath as I passed by. I really had been quite literally up to my elbows in my client's mess, and because Sis was so insistent, I hadn't changed out of my spandex Kevlar jumpsuit. I assumed, given how much it cost, the thing would wash up easily. But, because I didn't have the opportunity to throw it in the laundry, Bits of the job were still sticking to it when I arrived at Ephemera's place. She had done well, not quite as good as Cousin Vortex, who owned two villas and had timeshares on several Caribbean islands. Sis's place was a reproduction colonial in one of the better new developments. One of those architecturally controlled communities where even the type of grass you can plant is a caveat on the title. Being well beyond the end of the bus line and the fact it was a hot day meant by the time I rang the front doorbell, I was sweating profusely. The moisture reacted with the bits of my recently completed gig clinging to my jumpsuit in a not-so-good aromatic way. Sis opened the door, sniffed, then backed away with a sour look on her face. That is exactly why I didn't want a cat. Did you fall into a giant tray of kitty litter, Slow? Or is that a disguise to catch the thing? The wind changed direction. I caught a whiff of myself and backed away, which of course didn't help. I attempted to explain. Well, I've started something new. Uh, I call it time-assisted emergency cleanups. Got only a few minutes to clean up a big mess? Don't fret, call Dr. Slow-Mo. He'll literally take no time to wipe away your problem. L like my ad? No one else on Hero on the Way is into it, so I've got the whole cleanup sector thing cornered.
Ephemera gave me a critical stare, noticing a few bits of clingy stuff still stuck to my utility belt, and backed away a bit more. What's wrong? I mean, aside from the smell. You didn't give me time to shower and change. I came straight here. You said it was an emergency. In the backyard, slow. Sis nodded to the rear. I stepped forward. Not through the house. Walk around, I'll meet you there. Ephemera hesitated, licked a finger, and tested the wind direction. Take the left side. That would bring me downwind of her. It made me wonder what it had been like for the other passengers on the bus. You know how you kind of get desensitized to an odor after a few hours so you can't smell it yourself? When I rounded the corner of the house, I froze and gawked at the scene, trying to make sense of it. Sis's immaculately quaffed, professionally landscaped backyard looked like a herd of ravenous goats had chewed through the yard, followed by a herd of enraged elephants. The patio doors on the back of her house had been torn off, and a red-eyed Isabel sat on the remains of a lawn chair, crying. My kitty ran away. She pointed to a large hole in the fence, and I could see the trail of destruction continuing through on the other side. Sis carefully positioned herself upwind of me, arms folded, feet shoulder-width apart. She was poised for a fight. It's your fault, Slow. You gave Isabel that gene editing kit. The online review said it was perfectly safe. I protested defensively, then added, Last year I gave her a stuffy, and you all thought it too childish for a five-year-old with a brain the size of grandma's. I began to get a bad feeling. The reviewer hadn't been a verified buyer. Maybe I should have read more than one. I seem to be missing something here. Can you tell me what happened? Isabel choked back a sob and looked at me, wrinkling her nose. I moved to ensure I was downwind of her. Mommy wouldn't get me a kitty, so I made one. Out of bacteria? Isabel gave me the kind of smile only a six-year-old, who had solved her lack of a furry pet problem, could. Sort of, she coyly admitted. My friend Shanda helped. Who's Shanda? Sis demanded. Great grandma introduced me to her. She's really, really smart like me, except she's the voice of a computer. The supercomputer at the university? I asked hopefully, suspecting this might be a way to avoid complete blame for whatever debacle had taken place here. Isabel nodded shyly. I told her what my problem was. I told Shanda I needed a kitty that wouldn't poop or shed or need special cat food mommy would have to buy at the supermarket and told her about the kit. She said I should get a DNA sample from the cat across the street. I found a furball on their driveway. Izzy curled her nose. It was disgusting, so I asked for no furballs too. After that, it was easy. Shanda sent me instructions to modify a bacterium and mix it with the furball. A couple of days later, I opened the box and Mr. Kitty jumped out. He was perfect. Mr. Kitty didn't poop or shed, but now he's run away. Isabel began to cry again. But what happens when he eats? Where does the unused stuff go? I asked and judged from the scale of the damage. I already knew the answer. The thing has a 100% efficient digestive tract. It just grows instead of, you know, Sis explained, adding, Isabel fed the AI only a few parameters. She inadvertently created the classic paperclip problem. The what? This was a little over my head. I can mostly figure out how to use a cell phone app, but beyond that, I'm not what you would consider technical. Mommy explained it to me, Uncle Slow. If you give a machine the goal to build paperclips and said nothing else, 
it would keep making them until it had turned all matter in the universe into paper clips. Um, I think that's sort of what I did with Shanda. It's an omnivore slow, Sis clarified. It eats anything and just grows instead of excreting. And it's a self-sustaining feedback loop, an accelerating process. Left on its own, it'll eat the entire biosphere of the planet. I could see we had a bit of a problem. Again, it proved to me, good intentions never go unpunished. Grandma is just as culpable as me. I protested because I was right. Without the AI, little Isabel would be happily experimenting with designer bacteria. And what was the harm in that? It was the insidious machine's fault, which meant this whole debacle should come to rest at Grandma's feet. What was she thinking? Giving a hyper-intelligent six-year-old access to a supercomputer? Running a machine learning algorithm on a neuronet? Why didn't you call Grandma? This kind of thing is more up her alley anyway. Between her and Mum, they could wrap this up in a jiffy. After all, they are the brains and brawn of the family. I folded my arms in defiance. Grandma and Mom are on a yoga retreat. Grandpa and Dad are at some type of superhero retirement seminar. None of them are answering their phones. It's up to me, Cousin Vortex, and especially you to figure this out. Ephemera growled. And me too, little Izzy added. Soon, Cousin Vortex arrived in a flashy mini tornado, replete with lightning bolts and custom-designed brooding cumulus clouds, which formed his logo in the sky. I understand now why he rates so highly on Hero on the Way. I really needed to work on my own entrances. It wasn't hard to find Mr. Kitty. He was the only overly plump orange and black striped tabby with oversized dark brown eyes rising above the treetops. Mr. Kitty was busy munching on an entire cornfield. The four of us arrived on the lip of a vortex-inspired funnel cloud. Man, what a head rush that was. Of course, Mr. Kitty pretended to ignore us, but I could tell he was at least mildly interested. We dropped down onto the scorched earth in the ginormous cat's wake of destruction. Mr. Kitty! Isabel enticed, playing her role perfectly. Yes, my niece is a real smart and brave kid. Mr. Kitty feigned indifference and pawed another bushel of corn into its growing mouth. Here, Mr. Kitty! Isabel tried again. This time, the great feline turned its massive head to hear where the familiar voice was coming from. Meanwhile, Sis began to warp space between us and Mr. Kitty, and I guzzled two liters of water. The need grew quickly, and time slowed, giving Vortex, Sis, and little Izzy the opportunity they needed to set up. Isabel pulled a smelly cat treat out of a large Ziploc bag which was more potent than the detritus clinging to my jumpsuit. She backed away as Mr. Kitty turned to inhale the aroma, momentarily ignoring a paw full of corn to track the enticing smell of rotting fish. No doubt sensing something was wrong, Isabel bravely upped the ante with a second, smelly treat and waggled both at the cat. Mr. Kitty finally couldn't resist and hesitantly began to move toward me and Izzy, my own odorous presence adding to the bait. The thing stopped just short of the space warp Sis had willed into existence. It pawed experimentally at the almost invisible event horizon. That was when Cousin Vortex unleashed a hurricane force wind from a localized high pressure system he had conjured up behind Mr. Kitty. Pushed by the wind, the great beast lost its balance, tumbled into the space warp, and disappeared. Goodbye, Mr. Kitty, Isabel whispered as a tear rolled down one cheek. No one had seen us confront the genetically modified super feline, so Cousin Vortex whipped up a funnel cloud of destruction from Sis's backyard 
to the labs of a bioengineering company to cover our tracks and suggest another point of origin for Mr. Kitty. But where did you send him, Mommy? Isabel asked shyly. He's gone to a really nice farm where they have room for very large cats. Sis lied without missing a beat. Next year, when Isabel turns seven, I'm going to get her a gift card. As always, give me a five on Yelp. Or, if you have a mess that needs cleaning up fast, download the Hero on the Way app and select Dr. Slow-Mo from the drop-down menu. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. To listen to other great APN podcasts, such as Repodcasting, where Janet and Lucia recast favorite and not so favorite movies, they also cast Tony Danza because why not? Head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by ATB Financial. There's nothing like the feeling of putting a smile on someone's face. Enter ATB Goodness Grows, where one act of goodness can create a chain reaction across the province. Through Goodness Grows, ATB will be creating moments where Albertans can come together for a smile. Want to join in? Simply follow the hashtag ATB Goodness Grows on social to see all the goodness growing across Alberta. Follow along get inspired, and help share the goodness. This episode is brought to you by World on Fire, a new podcast from CBC Edmonton. World on Fire is a new five-part series that takes you to the front lines of -of out-of-control wildfires in Canada, Australia, and California. Recorded during the COVID-19 pandemic, hosts Adrian Lamb and Mike Flanagan look at what it takes to find hope in the midst of fear and destruction, and how communities affected by wildfires rebuild. The series examines the high costs that wildfires cause to people's health, homes, and communities. Find World on Fire on the CBC Listen app or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find it on cbc.ca slash worldonfire. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month around the 1st and the 15th. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Two. Audio post-production by Matthew Erdman. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by David Hume. To find out more about David, head over to davidhume.me. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite podcast services. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.